gonna be fun. Well, hello everybody, and thank you so much. I deeply appreciate it for tuning in to yet another episode of the Original Working Musicians Podcast. As always, I'm your faithful and loving servant of a host, Derice Organica. And today is the 29th episode of Working Musicians Podcast. Yay! And it, got, it kind of got me thinking about, geez, you know, thir- I'm about to be, in the next episode will be episode 30, and I feel like I should do something special. I really do. I think I need to get a couple people I know in on this one. I, it might be a long one, and that's okay. But I think for episode 30, I really need to do something special. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold out until I can get, until I can make this one extra special. I've put out so many here in the last couple weeks that, you know, I think that's a, that's enough you know, to where people don't feel like they've been cheated. If it takes me a couple weeks to get out episode 30, hell, I've put out like 10 in like two weeks. So whatever. But uh, I just really want this one to be, the the episode 30, I mean, the next one, to be something special. And, you know, perhaps it'll kind of mark a a change in the show from here on out. You know, who, who knows? Who knows? But I definitely want to do something special for it. But I mean, not to say I don't have something special in mind for this one, because I do. I have something very special in mind. But until then, until I get to the, the, the title of this episode, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, thank the uh, unofficial sponsors of this show. In this case, it is tea. I'm dr- now drinking a uh, cinnamon spice tea. Mm. With honey, it's pretty intense. Oh, yeah. I, I made sure to steep that one pretty dark. And then here in the background, I have a Pabst Blue Ribbon just waiting to be consumed. And I'll get to it at some point in the episode, but not until I'm done with my tea. It seems to be a winning combo. This is actually the third episode I'm attempting to do here in about a four-hour span. Because my episodes usually last an hour nowadays. And... uh that's probably my third episode in about three and a half hours. And because I woke up real early. So I've, I've done two episodes back to back like this, but never three. Usually by the time I get to after my second one, I'm so sloshed because it's late in the day and I've been drinking all night. You know, that's what helps make doing this fun. I like to have a toss back a few beers and speak my mind. <laughs> Go figure, right? Who, who would have thought that would have been entertaining? But for me, it is at the very least. So this is a, this is uncharted territory. It is, it is, and it is indeed. I've got a so, but I have to go about it a little differently. I can't just go slamming beers, and nor do I want to, because after after you drink a beer, it starts to get a little cold. So I put on a jacket because I was here in like my uh, my basketball sleeping shorts, which is I wear basketball shorts to go sleep. You know, it's kind of like the little thin, meshy kind of net gym sort of shorts. And I usually sleep shirtless. I don't know why. I just have to sleep. I, I can't sleep with a shirt on unless it's really cold. But then you get out of it, you know, out of the covers and you, geez, it's actually kind of wintery time, you know, because it's January or something like that here in Texas. And um, not to say that it's cold, but it's definitely jacket weather outside. And uh, I've got the AC turned off. So the fan just occasionally turns on and recirculate, recirculates. And it's around 66 degrees inside the house, which is great. I mean, hell, that's wonderful during the summer, you know, but, uh, it's just, I, I prefer it more like 74, 75. My wife, more like 68 to 70. That's, that's where she likes it. So this is a little cold for my taste, and it's not a big deal, uh, you know, if I drink a, a tea or a coffee. But after I've had a beer or two, it's, you get, ew, I, get, I get real cold immediately after. So I've now got a hoodie on over my naked chest. I have a hoodie. I, I'm putting on a hat, my favorite Packers hat. I've got, like, basically two ball caps. Well, we got a few of them, but... One of them says like Jay's Clay's on it. It's some stupid or burnt orange looking hat. And I wear it when, I have, when I'm have when i doing something that I, where I just need to keep the sun off my face. I'm going to be sweating like an animal. I wear that one. And then I've got this NASCAR hat, which is the, my newest hat. And boy, do I look extra intelligent wearing that. Let me tell you, I look like the biggest trailer park dumbass you ever saw wearing that hat, which is why I love it so much. 
And then I've got my favorite hat, which is this thing's at least 10 years old, maybe 15 years old at this point. It's a Green Bay Packers football hat. And this thing used to be a dark, magnificent, like navy blue. Now it's like a light, dingy gray. And I, I keep it clean, but, you know, it's got natural areas where the hat has kind of like torn. But it looks like I did it on purpose, but just where it is, because I always grab it from these two spots on either side of the hat, sometimes with my right hand, sometimes with my left hand, but where my thumb touches the bill, it uh, it started to wear away, and it's got a nice peel mark. Uh, you know, it's got a few of them, and it's just a very nicely, nice worn in hat, you know? I love it. Now, that's, that's basically my hat. Now, that's a hat. That's a real hat. I mean, I've done work in it. I've done play, play in it. I've done everything in this hat. Now, unfortunately, the the Packers didn't aren't going to the Super Bowl, but not to date this show too much. But at any rate, they're they're not going to the Super Bowl. They lost to the Falcons, so whatever. That's okay. That's okay. <clears throat> uh, as long as somebody beats the damn Patriots, because I'm so sick of the Patriots. Shit, it's freaking annoying. You're not allowed to be that good. I tell you who I really hate. I just hate him. It's Tom Brady. Because it is not right that you be good looking, be very talented in a sport, and have a hot wife. Like, you know, the, the, it just doesn't work like, the, like that way. Generally, the Lord giveth and he taketh away. So I'm sure somewhere along the lines he has a major shortcoming. And I hope it's in his penis. I hope he has the world's tiniest penis so that I feel more justified by the hand I was dealt as a human being, you know? Because I'm not as good looking. I don't have his. Uh, as much, uh, you know, physical, like natural ability as a talent, you know, so I just feel like that, oh man, it's messed up, you know? So hopefully he has something that's going wrong. <laughs> I'd, like he has webbed feet. I hope he has webbed feet <laughs> just to kind of even, even it out for you. You're not allowed to have everything, you asshole. Sounds like I got a bromance going on. I just don't like Tom Brady because I just don't like to like Tom Brady. He's not, it's not the, I don't even, he's probably a great guy. Probably, probably real cool, but I just hate him. You know what I mean? Cause I hate him because I love to hate him. You know, there's people you just love to hate. Oh, well, that's what it is. It's a love hate relationship because I love to hate. And they always kick the shit out of the, out of the, the Houston Texans. I mean, every time it's just a bloodbath. Uh, I can't stand watching every time they play the Patriots. It just sucks. But at any rate, so I'm all, I've, oh, I've even got some leopard fuzzy slippers on. I don't know why they were downstairs, but I found them when I was going down there to freshen up my beer and tea. And uh, so I got some fuzzy slippers on. I'm feeling nice and warm and cozy. This is nice. And I'm ready to get into my 39th episode of Working Musicians podcast. Yes. So now it took me a second to get started. Uh, I went to the Denny's yesterday on the way home. I may have mentioned in a pre one of these other ep- episodes that I've done here just recently. It would have been either episode 28 or 27, because this is an episode 29. I've done three in a row in the same sitting, so to speak. <clears throat> and uh, the traffic was really bad going home, so I'm like, you know what? Let's, let's just turn around and go to the Denny's, right? So we went to the Denny's, and we were there for a little over an hour. Because it's like, well, the kids are just screaming. We've been out all day looking at stuff, and I don't blame them. The kids are tired of being in the car, in their car seats. And they were very vocal about it, to say the least. Let me just say, I'm not going to get into it with my, you know, how my kids are, but I've got some screaming kids. And, geez. So we're at the Denny's, and usually, I, if I go to Denny's, I go there in the morning and I get breakfast. That's kind of what I like Denny's for. But it's in the evening. And there's one, only one thing I will, I generally ever order at Denny's in the evening. And and it stemmed from back in my younger days when I'd go to Denny's after the bar with clothes. I'd be at Denny's at like two or three in the morning, that kind of thing. And it's the zesty nachos. It is like the best thing to help you sober up. But it's as a result, that's like the only thing I ever want to eat at Denny's. So I usually get the full order and it's like, can I eat it? Sometimes I can eat it. Sometimes I can't even come close. You know, it just depends on how I feel that day or how much pain I feel like being in. Well, let's just say, uh, after eating those yesterday at around the, you know, 
6 o'clock this morning, I had to take what the Urban Dictionary calls a Tronald dump. Oh, man. I feel great. <laughs> so I figured I would share. You know, because sharing is caring. And clearly, I care quite a bit. Oh, yes. So, yeah, definitely. I want to make episode 30 something extra special. But something I just now got, got to thinking about, because I've the two guys I want to get on this show are two people who are very near and dear to me, and people I've talked about talked to personally about wanting, you know, about them getting on the show. And I, I kind of get it. It's kind of like, well, you know, this is something that just got started. You know, coordinating, it's, it takes time. Is this really going to be like a waste of time? I mean, it'll be fun. We all get that. But, you know, our free time is all limited. So I was just thinking, you know, but at this point, this is episode 30. And they all, they all sound like they want to do it. They enjoy the show. You know what I mean? They chime in on it periodically and give me feedback. They have helped get me some some additional listeners. So I, I think that they'd be interested in coming on from based on what they've told me. It's just the problem is arranging it. And I kind of think that it might be cool to do something to where we all three get together, you know, in the same space, in the same room, and just do it that way. And then after after seeing how that goes, maybe I can kind of bring them in here and there. Um just over the phone or Skype, you know what I mean? And then just record what they do because they all have some kind of you know, hell, there are people I work with, they all have, they've all recorded stuff, they all have their own little mini studios, I mean, hell, uh, that's just, just kind of how it is nowadays, seems like in order to be a musician, you also have to know a little bit about recording and all that stuff too, just kind of sign of the times, you know? Now, the only thing is, and this is something that we've talked about in the past, is that you know, the show is not about actively promoting our current projects or ourselves as what we do. Not to say that in some way, shape, or form, it wouldn't necessarily do that, but that's why I don't use my real name. That's why I don't really actively promote anything I do. I mean, yes, if you want to find my music, you can. I've got a few, six songs or so on Reverb Nation. Look for Dryce Organic, a big deal. You know, and I've even got some for sale if you want. You know, so far not a whole lot of people have picked up on that one, so you can download it for free. I don't give a shit. You know, whatever. But, of course, if you feel like contributing to the cause, I greatly appreciate it. You know, that maybe if, if this year goes like last year, I'll be able to buy a new keyboard. You know, that'd be sweet. One with a, a media button so I can hit pause or until I figure out how to change the keyboard shortcuts in Reaper, which I know there's a way. But at any rate, you know, I just got to think of it. All these guys have the ability to where, I mean, I just have to, we just both have to be in the position to do it at the same time. You know, between me, my, uh, the drummer guy who's also my brother, or one of my really good friends who's a bass player, guitar player, singer extraordinaire, does everything. You know, he's a real interesting fellow that would bring a lot of interesting perspective, as is my brother. But the problem is, we've talked about this, and we don't want to, like, sell ourselves that's not the idea like our, our personal stuff that we do you know that's not it at all uh but at the same time we we don't so we can't use our real names but at the same time we, we're gonna have to draw upon our experiences that's what makes this fun and credible i guess you could say is we've all had pretty good at different and different experiences doing music stuff but at the same time we don't want to talk about stuff that could potentially have a negative backlash for anyone else. And it's kind of hard to do that, be honest, and not potentially do stuff that makes puts other people or instances or other places, things, whatever, in a bad light. That's not the goal of it. And I'll be the first one to tell you. There are some, there are some things that I think suck. That's my opinion. Not everyone agrees. Uh, I think line six uh, overall sucks. Everything they make, I think, sucks. That's just my opinion. I don't like it. It's cool in theory, just not in reality. I think Vox makes cool stuff, but some of their stuff sucks. I think Marshall's a great amp company, but some of the stuff they make sucks. I like some Fender, I hate some Fender. You know what I mean? It's just how it, that's these are my opinions. I like Toyota, I don't like Dodge, but you know what? I might buy a Dodge truck because they make some a certain product that nobody else does. You know, it's just one of those things. Just because I don't don't like something doesn't mean I wouldn't necessarily use it. It just means it's not my favorite for whatever reasons. I, I dislike certain things just because of how I choose to operate, which might be, I might be in the extreme minority, right? So the point is, 
it's hard to say that, hey, I don't care for something or give something a negative review or put it something in a negative light without, you know, without causing a backlash. And that's not what we want to do. And so some of these people, if I had talked to, have worked with, you know, different artists in, in a way where it could provide a negative backlash for people who are semi-famous or very famous, so I guess you could say in their perspective field. So that's something that we had to be very careful with. So I wanted to make sure that the premise of the show is not the kind of thing where, you know, it's out there bashing people or people who've heard it this far would be offended, you know. And I think we've managed to do that. So the thing is, if they were to come on, there's one kind of caveat. And that is that they couldn't use their real names. So the the friend of mine, who's a bass guitar player, singer extraordinaire, I think we've kind of discussed it that if he were to come on, his stage name would be Roger Flowers. <laughs> Why not, right? If you ever met him, it's a good name for him. It just makes sense somehow. But my brother, we haven't really come up with something good. I mean, he's like, okay, gluteus maximus. I'm like, no, dude, no, that doesn't work. Since I've already revealed that he's my brother, and that apparently since my last name is Organica, that means we must have the both the same last name, right? And he's really a drummer. So I'm like, huh, what kind of name him? Stick Sticks Organica. I'm like, how about Stiffy? <laughs> Your name is Stiffy Organica. So I think that'd be something fun because I'm pretty. I'm I'm just gonna have to. I'm throwing out the gauntlet. They are coming on the show with me. That's just. It just. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. They're coming on the show. I don't care if I got to go to them. We are getting them on the show. Because it'd be so much fun. I guarantee you, you'd like them. Uh, at least partially as much as I do. So maybe there'll be some kind of fun, like <laughs> on episode 30, I'm sitting there actively saying, you know, trying to figure out a good name for him. I got it. Woodpecker Organica. Ha <laughs> ha. <And like, laughs> I remember when I was helping him name his son. <laughs> oh, his, his wife was just getting pissed at me. How about the name Pubert? <laughs> Come on, who names their kid Pubert? <laughs> That's ridiculous. You know, but if you understand, my, you know, me and my brother's sense of humor, then it makes sense. Yeah, she's a... Uh, kind of new to the family so she's kind of getting uh familiarized with it you know which everyone outside of me and him tend to hate but that's how it is so that's kind of some of the things i want to do for this next episode and it's here as soon as i say it it may end up being such a nightmare to make it happen that it just doesn't happen but i'd really like it to at the very least so as far as the title of this episode it's going to be called Leadership. I have very straightforward, plain and simple. Leadership. Um, and granted, you could you could use this outside the realm of you know music, but this is really more so from the perspective of like a band leader. Because that was me at one point, and I not and I was kind of young and experienced at it, and I wasn't really one for more than a couple years, I guess you could say, before things fell apart. Not to say I was even a successful one. <laughs> That's not the point here. It's just to kind of shed some light and experiences over what I've done, what I've seen, and other people. And just experiences that I've heard and seen from other people, it's kind of all blended with my own to kind of create a uh, a general picture of what it really means to be a leader uh, in the, as a musician, right? But the truth is, a lot of these things hold true for other professions or other fields or other avenues of life, you know? Well, I'll be the first to tell you I was not a very good band leader at the time. What I can tell you is that learning what I have learned in my professional life, if I were to have known that then, uh, definitely things would have come out a lot differently. And I realize that now. Not to say that things would have changed or that things wouldn't have happened, but they wouldn't, you know, the same, obviously we would not still be playing together. I, I'm not bitter about that. All. That's just how it goes. It's not a big deal. I don't want it to come across that way because I'm, Hell, I don't even really want to be in a band at this point. It's not doesn't entertain me. If I wanted to do it, I'd be doing it. But I definitely know that some things would have gone a little smoother. I know that there that uh there wouldn't have been the level of resentment at the time that things fell apart. And I think things would have been much more amicable and that we would have worked together better had I been a better band leader. But, you know, come on, what do you expect from someone who's 18, 19, 20? It's just how it goes. So, just I want to talk about some things that, you know, I know about being a band leader from my experiences and that from that of others. So, here we go. 
And before I start, I have just finished up my tea, my delicious cinnamon non-caffeinated tea, which kind of sucks. I wish it was caffeinated because I love cinnamon tea. It's absolutely great. And the store close by me has a, they have their own store brand, so it's a little cheaper and it's great. And I get a little discount. It's wonderful. Hmm. I should probably move that. Wow, that beer mixed with the essence and smell of that tea is just, it's absolute magic. I might have to cancel the show and just drink this all day. Mm. Sorry, one more time. <sighs> Delightful. Yeah, after the sun comes out, I'm going to go uh, flush my brake system. I need to, I've need i got the fluid for it. I just need to go flush. It's not that big of a job, but it's a lot of up and down when you're doing it by yourself, but whatever. No biggie. Okay, so being a band leader, or leadership in general. <clears throat> Rule number one to leadership. And this, is, this applies to everything, all right? And that's this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So that doesn't mean you need to go around giving people big hug, bear hugs and kisses, slobbery kisses all day. But what it does mean is that if you're going to be working with people in any way, shape or form, it's equally, if not more important to let them know that you care about them as a person, that you respect them as a person enough to care about them. All right? Because if you don't, they don't have any interest in working with you. They just don't. It just it's kind of like goes against the grain for them. Because if people don't feel like you respect them, uh, it's even if they respect you, they're going to be very off put by you. And so that's where I think it becomes very important to make sure that when you have a a meeting with your band members, right? I'm just going to kind of stick mostly to the the realm of being a band leader. Like you're the guy who's kind of like the centerpiece of the band, got everything started. Maybe you're the Oftentimes, it's like what I call the uh, guitar player slash songwriter. Sometimes they're the singer, sometimes they're not. Oftentimes, they want to be the singer, but they just have to be realistic and realize that they just don't have the chops to be the singer, so they have to bring someone in. And oftentimes, the guitar player and the singer resent each other a little bit because the guitar player wants to be the singer, but unfortunately, they can't sing, and they want to, they want to try to do some singing, and the, the vocalist gets a little put off because he sucks. You know what I mean? There's a little bit of cat and mouse and some resentment there that can't happen between a you know a, a singer and a guitar a singer and the guitar player oftentimes because oftentimes the guitar player is a songwriter and kind of like one of the band leaders and so I, I, I mentioned off with rule one management 101 is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care so when you're leading a band you want to make sure that it's not all just about the band. The music, it's it's about them. You want to put you want to put a focus on each one of them and make sure that they know that you respect them and that you respect their opinions, right? And that's that's easier said than done, and here's why. Because initially, you know, let's say you come together and you got and you've got like a bunch of song ideas, you know, you've written a bunch of songs, you just don't have them all like prepared for a full band, right? You might have some vocal lines down, this, that, and some ideas, but you've got the whole song laid out. And let's say you've got a whole CD, for that matter, right? And, you know, <clears throat> let's say you are the singer and the, the guitar player and the songwriter, right? And you just need a couple guys that can, one that can play bass, one that can play guitar, or that kind of thing. It doesn't really change things. Uh, but what what's going to happen is people want to be able to put in their creative input and I think it's one of those things where it's like, it, it kind of depends on what it is, on what the, the nature of the, the project is. If, and I think it's good to be clear right, off, right up front on what, what you really are looking for in people to do, because people won't be as quite as off-put by their creative vision being squashed a little bit if they don't expect for it to be something that, that's, you know, if they don't expect for it to be really something that's taken to great value. Like, for example, <clears throat> let's say you are a guitar player singer, right? You write the songs and you're pretty much the one funding everything, you know? 
like if the band goes to the studio, you fork the bill. You're the one making the, uh, the booking the gigs and doing all that stuff. You've got the PA system. You're doing all that kind of stuff. You know, it's kind of an understood thing, but still it's, it bears repeating that you might want to let the guys in the band know, hey, look, this is, this is the, how I work. This is, this is kind of what I've got going on. You know, I write music. Obviously, if you if you hear something like when we're we're writing a new song that you think is cool, yeah, go ahead, bring it to the table. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, just please be respectful of the fact that I'm the one forking the bill for just about everything. In that, yes, you know, you guys are getting paid, but you're getting paid off of the songs I've written, off the gigs I've booked. You know what I mean? So it's not like I'm trying to be a dick, but let's just be realistic. I'm the one putting in all the extra work. Realistically, all I need you guys to do is just be committed enough to show up. Make sure you're rehearsed and have a good time. You know what I mean? And help us entertain the audience. That's what I'm looking for. In that case, it's not to say that, at least from the get-go, that you're not looking for you know, full-time band members, but initially you're kind of looking for a hired gun because you're trying to get a project up off the ground, right? And that's an understandable thing. Like People get that. You know, It's like, hey, I've already got an album written. These are the parts. You may not agree with everything, but that's fine. Like It's already written. Just play it kind of like this. You know what I mean? However, at some point, if that goes well and you want to make a second album, which good luck, I mean, that's, that's a good start. I think if you're going to be a, a band leader, it's a good idea to start with a start with, with an album. You know what I mean? Hey, the goal is, okay, guys, come in. Let's, I've got a whole al- CD ready to go. Like What I would do is I'd have uh, already done all the pre-production you need to do, especially if you're a singer, guitar player, slash bass player. Go ahead and get all that recorded. Get you a drummer in there to record the actual drum. So everything's ready to go. So pretty much when you go to hire, you know, bring people into the band, you've got a CD ready to go. It's just a matter of, hey, let's learn the material. Let's rehearse it. Let's not waste a lot of time on this because I value your time. But, you know, here's the CD. If you would, practice it on your own time. We're going to do a, you know, a few rehearsals and then we're going to start doing some gigs. So it's kind of like they come in and they see their the return on the investment really quick. It's like, hey, guys, at first... Initially, you know, this is an original act, so you, you know, I, I, I'll give you a little money for your time, but we're not going to be having a huge head count initially. That's just kind of the way it goes, and people who are doing original music understand that, and they get it. But when they see that you're already starting with a CD, you know, and that you, you know, you have a, a game plan in mind, like, hey, we've got a CD going, we've got that printed and going. I've already forked the bill for that. But we're going to play a few shows, see how, how things go before we start having a CD release party and really spread the word. Because essentially, we just got to get out there and do this a few times so that we know what we're doing and we know how to gel as a band. Fair enough. And then you go to get your CD. You know. But the point is on all this is you're, tell- you're letting them know, hey, this is the plan of action. This is what I plan to do. And this is how I plan on us making some money out of this. You know. I'll give you 50 bucks to show up for your, just to cover your gas and a little bit into your beer tab. You know, it'll be a good time. And if that, if you're going about it that way, people don't mind that, you know, you're the one calling the shots as much, right? They just don't mind because they go in, they have a good time. You know, you've done a lot of the work, but when it comes to writing the second CD, it might be a good idea to kind of lend some creative vision out there if you feel it's necessary. Uh, and some people, you know, it just depends, and you just have to play that by ear. But at the very least, you know, people want to feel like their uh, creative vision is valued. And if they're good people worth having, it's good to value it, because two heads are better than one. But, of course, what ends up happening is, well, there's writers, loyal, you know, royalties that have to be paid out. Who cares? The odds of you becoming successful to the point where that matters are so insig- in- insignificant and unlikely that it's, it's a mute point. I wouldn't even worry about it. Don't even worry about that kind of stuff. What I would say is, <clears throat> once you get a, you know, an, especially an original act, or whether it's covers, but, you know, original is a little, it's a little bit different than covers because covers, you start off making money a little bit quicker, but it is what it is. You're always playing covers. It never really gets any better or worse. You know, it's just always kind of the same. The only difference is you get a little bit better, you know, learn some more songs. But it takes a lot more time and investment to get a cover band up and running sometimes and does an original band, but you're initially more lucrative. <clears throat> but that's the kind of thing where you have a strong band leader who's pretty much calling the shots, but you're also doing all the work, you know, all the legwork, all the behind the scenes stuff. You're 
you're paying people with the money that you get from the proceeds, which is ideal. But you know, it's it's one of those things where like if you make two hundred dollars and the other guys make a hundred dollars, nobody's really complaining, right? Because hey, I get it. Or you know, hey guys, this isn't going to be the world's best gig. It's going to be a set. You know, just let them know that this is a seventy-five dollar gig. This is a hundred fifty dollar gig. It is. It's only two hours. You know, it's only an hour. This is a you know whatever it is. Um, but if you, that's the kind of you know role you want to have, then set it from the beginning and let them know that this is kind of how it is, and they, they generally understand and respect it. But you also want to make sure that you respect them as people, and that you communicate, and you're just very clear with with uh, your expectation, you know, expectations of each other and oneself right from the beginning. And they generally are appreciative of that, and they they get it, you know, especially if you're you're the one doing all this. Now, if it's now, it gets very very different when. And that's those kind of examples are kind of fewer and far between, right? But there are definitely, I'd say, some of the most successful bands are run like that, right? That that make the most names for themselves and get the furthest. Then there's the kind of bands that I think are the most common, especially when it comes into originals. And I'm not going to really talk about cover stuff, even though it's equally as important. I mean, I'll I'll touch base with covers. I guess I'll touch base with covers after I get finish up with the original band, right? And in this next scenario, I want to talk about what I would call the typical original band. It's kind of like more so like a group of friends or some, you know, somebody puts, usually it's a group of friends or somebody who knows somebody or like two or so people look, reach out and try to network and they find another person or two to join a band. And you'll have, you'll basically have just a group of people with an idea that you want to make music and then kind of go from there. And that's kind of how things start, right? <clears throat> so you all get together you start jamming it's more kind of a a time consuming thing at first but i think that's what a lot of people like it gives them something constructive to do and that's what they're looking for initially they're looking for something constructive now time goes by next thing you know you've got you know enough songs to make a, a set so you go book a gig you do a you, you you play it you know it's okay cool you learn from it you go you, you do a few more and it becomes fun, but after you've done like 10 or 15 or 20 of those, it's kind of like, okay, now what? You know, it's kind of hard to be content after doing 10 original shows with a band that you've been rehearsing with for a year and you've got a you know full CD worth of stuff out there, but you don't have a recording, you don't have any merch, you don't have anything. It's kind of like, well, now what? You know, and I think it's kind of important to have that conversation early on like, hey guys, what do you expect to get out of this? What do you want to do with this? Because if you don't have those conversations early on, there's a good chance that you, <laughs> the conversations you have later on are going to be a little bit more sticky and complicated. <clears throat> and uh, usually from this process, a leader kind of emerges. And typically it's either the singer or the songwriter, uh, which is usually the guitar player. And I don't know why it's always like that, but everyone, it's kind of like one of those things like after... After uh, a while, you know, I think it's important that you guys are up front in the beginning. It's like, okay, so guys, we're going to kind of get together and just start doing this for a little while. We're not going to try to set ep- expectations initially, but this is, look, this is what I would like to do. What do you guys want this, this group to, what do you want to accomplish with this? This is just something we do periodically and play shows and we're fine with that. If everyone's fine with that, cool. If it's one of those things where you want to get a CD going and maybe try to spread it around and try to make a little bit of a name for yourself, you know, and see what happens. That's fine, you know, but get it out there in the open so that everyone kind of understands the overall direction you're going to. Uh, at the very least, you'll establish a direction. What you have not done established is, is a speed or exactly how it gets there. But, you know, don't worry about selling a product that you haven't even made yet. <laughs> you know, don't worry about that yet. Cross that bridge when you get there. But once you do get to a point where you've played a few shows and it's kind of one of those things where you, you kind of find like people's roles. And it's always the good thing about having a band like that is that you can kind of uh, establish sort of like roles. So what, what it usually works out is somebody will have like the best place, the rehearsal pad, right? You know, and somebody's usually kind of like the one that helps coordinate things. And then oftentimes there's one that helps uh, book gigs, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it's just, or somebody who has this or that, but find whatever it is and try to find a balance to where everybody's putting in something 
right? And don't worry about it being 100% equal. Just try to make sure that everyone does something to contribute to the effort of making the band successful, right? And usually through this process, what happens is you have somebody who's primarily writing the music, and usually that person is the one who kind of coordinates brand practices and, and all this kind of stuff. But where it gets difficult is you don't want it to be in a, in a, in a circumstance like that where everyone kind of gets together and it grows organically. It's What oftentimes will happen is one person will kind of come in and take the lead and take the reins and really pull and push the band where it where they want them to go. But it ends up becoming a futile effort because then the other guys are like, well, hey, who made you the boss? You know, it's like, well, if if I don't, then we don't do anything, you know. So I think it's important to, and it gets difficult where then you have somebody who's trying to book shows and then, well, I can't do it that day. Well, I have this or that. Well, how do you expect me to book shows if you can't be open? So you have to start talking about availability. Hey, guys, let's try to make it, Make sure that you have the fourth sun Saturday of every month off. That's that's fair. You know what I mean? So you have to figure out something to where like, hey, you, you, if you don't make the band a priority at all, you will never be able to play. And it's just very, very difficult. So you have to establish not just expectations on early on where, where the band is going to go, but at some point you have to you know define roles within the band. And you also... <clears throat> have to define roles once you start pulling, getting to the point where you can play is like hey we've got to be able to have it to where you you we take this day off every month and we have a show i don't care if we just have one show a month i'm going to make sure that we're you know we're going to book a show for this day every month right we're going to book a show for the first saturday the second friday the the, the third tuesday it doesn't matter just set a time that this is when we do things. We have band practice this one day a month, every month, you know what I mean? Whatever it is. So that you know, hey, there's two days a month that you need to commit to this. And usually, you know, early on, it's more so, it's a little different. It's a little funner, but a little bit more chaotic because you're just trying to get stuff, you know, worked on and, and together. But once you get to a certain point after about six months, it, it, it kind of like, okay, we're ready to really get rolling. Sometimes less than that, but around six months, that's when you have to really go back and start talking about, okay, how are we going to do this? Now, usually the person who goes about thinking about things like this ends up being the band leader. But if you're going to go be the band leader and you're going to go about it in a group that's kind of like a, hey, we're all in this together kind of a thing, you just cannot go about things the same way that the person who already has a full CD recorded is the one booking all the shows, is financially backing everything. You cannot go about things the same way that that person does. I mean, I think it's fair as the reason, stands to reason, doesn't it? And uh, in all fairness, the, the reason why I think those the the latter, where you have the band that grows together organically, those sometimes have the hardest time really getting to that that level to where they've got a CD and they've really got merch and all that stuff going because. Initially, nobody was really putting anything, any money into it. And then at some point, you have to start putting a little bit of money into it. And that's where it gets complicated. It's like, all right, guys, let's record a CD. How are we going to go about doing this? Well, hmm. Then it comes to the point, well, how much of the record sales am I going to get? You know, and that's where it gets, well, I'm not putting in 25% if I'm going to get 10% out. And that's where I really think the only way to go in that kind of a situation is, we put in we put in twenty five percent. Yeah, if there's four of us, we're we're in four ways. Whatever the costs are, we split evenly. Whatever the proceeds are, we split evenly, and just go about it from there. Because odds are, you're not going to be successful enough to where it really makes a big difference. You know, even if you play twenty shows a year and you net you know ten thousand dollars out of it, I don't think that the difference that you'd get from getting twenty five hundred dollars versus four thousand dollars is enough. To really merit a, a big argument it just it's inconsequential it's it's who cares and odds are you won't even make that much if even and the only reason you'll even make that much is because you sold merchandise you're not going to get it off of a headcount and ticket sales that's not how this works 
you have to sell merchandise. In order to have merchandise, you have to buy it, and you have to make it, and you have to make it all happen. And that's where it really, like, the, uh, the role of the band leader becomes very different in that case, because you actually have to be more of a leader in that scenario and really have be- exhibit better leadership characteristics, because when you're actively working with people in the writing phase, what you have is a lot of more me syndrome. Everyone wants to shine. They want to look like they're good, but not everyone is great. And even if everyone is great, you know, what does the music call for? If it doesn't call for a guitar solo, don't try to put a guitar solo. And it's one of those things where I think early on, if you, if you exhibit the behavior that, hey, we're leaving ego out of this, you will be better for it because ego will destroy your band so fast. I mean, that is like the number one destroyer of bands is ego. So if you don't want ego to destroy your band and you're kind of emerging as the band leader, then make sure that you don't let your ego make decisions for you, right? Uh, And in the writing process, this is sometimes kind of hard to do because if you write the guitar parts and that's kind of how the songs originate, then, well, yeah, there's a good chance the guitars are going to be kind of cool. But keep in mind that you need to Give room for other instruments to breathe, and it'll, it'll ultimately make the song better. And don't worry about trying to shine. That's not what's important. If the music sounds great and is the and it's everything makes sense, you will shine more so than playing a bunch of solos in a shitty band. It's like who cares? You still look crummy, right? So the better the whole group shines, the more you will shine individually. And that's the best attitude and approach to take on that kind of thing. Another thing to keep mind of is, as a leader, you don't want to have a pissing contest with people, or the mind's bigger than yours, and that, and that, once again, it comes down to ego. A lot of this comes down to ego. One of the biggest things a good leader has to be able to do is put their pride and ego in check, because it doesn't matter how cool you are. Like, cool people don't get very far as leaders. Like, I'll tell you this much. I'll be the first to tell you that I am not very cool, and that's what makes me a good leader. I'm not worried about trying to impress people with how cool I am or how great I am. That's not what people are looking for in a leader. They're looking for somebody who understands them and will listen to them and who genuinely cares about them. So if you kind of notice that you're in that leadership spot, you know, in a band that kind of grows organically, and that's kind of how, how things work, think about it like this. These are people that who are helping you produce your music, right? They're putting in a quarter of the income, they're, therefore they're getting a quarter of the proceeds, right? They're putting, a, they're forking a quarter of the expenses. They're putting in their time and effort. You need to respect that, even if you're the one writing all the songs and booking the gigs. Keep in mind, you cannot do that without them, and you need to be respectful of that. And sometimes. It entails you having to kind of take the back seat on some issues. You know, let them be right. It doesn't matter. Let them win, uh, you know, a difference of opinion here and there just for the sake of letting them win. Just because it, it let, allows you to, and it gives them the room to believe that you are actually considering what they're saying, right? And if it's such a small minutia, who cares? It's like, you know, hey, you know what, guys? Why are we even fighting about this? It's, it's a big deal. If you like it like that, go ahead. Who cares? You're the one playing the bass, not me. If you like your hi-hat sound to be like that during this part, who cares? Nobody outside of us, nobody's going to care, you know? And, and be able to laugh at yourself and go back. And guys, you know, I'm sorry. I don't know why I was making such a big deal out of this. It's so insignificant. You know what I mean? Let's just move on, you know? And, and do, doing that kind of thing, because if you can laugh at yourself and go back and apologize for being a little over the top, that's great. because. If you're willing to do it for yourself, people are going to be more uh, re, uh, able to admit that they were unrealistic, you know, or they were being a little over the top or just too judgmental or just too nitpicky and just too focused on a detail that really doesn't matter. And I think that's a good thing. Try not to focus too much on the small minutia and details that really don't matter because, you know, that hi hat, cl- that hi hat part in one, two beats measures of a song are really pretty insignificant to the overall big picture, so long as it doesn't just completely annoy the hell out of everyone listening. It's like, hey, dude, I ain't trying to be a dick, but you're doing like way too many Tom fills here. Just, just Can you just keep the beat, man? I, I think it really sounds better that way. So if you have the, 
open communication and you can and you can go back and and tell people hey i was wrong that is huge being able to admit that you you know maybe you were wrong or didn't make the best decision is huge because if you can do it the others will do it if you never admit that other people are right or you never admit that maybe your vision wasn't the best one or you at least don't entertain the fact that hey maybe even though this person isn't the best songwriter they actually that's actually a good idea you know what i mean explore it even if it takes up some of your time at least explore it because sometimes when you write a song you've already explored that avenue but they haven't explored it yet it's worth the 10 or 15 minutes of your time to just explore that that avenue that you've already done before when you were writing the song just so that they know it doesn't work otherwise it'll always be in the back of their mind like man it'd be so much better if they did if we did this but once they've heard it and they realize it's not better then things change but at least they'll know. And that's just what I'm saying. Like you have to be able to swallow your pride, put your ego in check, and allow people to put in the input that they want to. Otherwise, they'll just feel like they're not really part of this. And that's where it gets real difficult. People have to, if you want people to be invested in it, you've got to give them a reason to invest in it. And you've got to get them to invest in it by putting in input and effort. And if you squash all their input and effort as being crap, Guess what? They're not going to be very invested in it. And at the end of the day, initially on bands that grow like that, time and energy are the main things that everyone puts in. If the second somebody kind of uh, gets squashed, they tend to not put in a whole lot of time and effort. And then that kind of creates problems. <clears throat> so, oh, you know, now granted, where things really get sticky with those bands is that's a whole process writing enough songs and then pre creating a set. You know, once you get to that point, I've already talked about, you know, guys, we need to make a commitment. What day can you commit consistently so that we can book shows? Right. Otherwise it's like we book a show and like, Oh, I can't do it. Well, how was I supposed to know that? How are we supposed to book shows? You know, we got to figure out, Hey, let's, let's have a meeting. Let's get together. Let's, let's have a few beers. Let's hang out, but let's, let's have a meeting on, on, on okay let's talk about these months what you know this is six months out you know or three months out what what nights can you do you know, oh you're going on vacation this week okay get a bit, big calendar out and y'all figure this out hey these are the nights we can play right okay such and such hey can you call these two places can you call these four places can you talk to the guy you know over there oh you, you know what i mean kind of map out what the direction the band is going to be for the next three, four, five, six months. And you can have these two, three, four times a year. And they're very, very positive things to do because it, it, you're not so much worried on working on music. It's more of a, a time to get together and just kind of hang out and talk. But at the same time, you get to a little business and you kind of map out what the direction of the band's going to do for that year or for that three-month period or six-month period or whatever it is you all tend to do. But basically, you're assigning availability and in, in, in your committing to a different time frame so that when y'all do go around to booking gigs it's like hey you look bro you already committed you're already committed and this is what it is no we're not canceling you already committed cancel that fit you're just not gonna you just can't go that you can't do that with your girlfriend this one that day you already committed and how can they how can they say no they were there with you and they committed to it everyone agreed you know what i mean and generally it won't even come up huh <sighs> So then comes the issue of okay, so hey, we want to record a CD. All right, guys, we, we're 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 a four, we're all equal shares. It's all put in. It's going to cost a thousand bucks. Everyone put in two fifty, two fifty, two fifty, two fifty. Kind of sucks. Okay, we got the CD going. It sounded good. We rehearsed it. We're at that, that point. You got to come in ready to rehearse. Let's say that all that goes smoothly, which there's always some contingency there. Somebody isn't quite as good at rehearse as you'd like them to be, and that's just how that goes, right? But then it gets to the point, it's like, okay, now we've got a CD, now we've got to pay to get it duplicated and all this stuff. Well, who's going to do that? Do we just want to pass out demos? Do we just want to put out MP3s? Well, who's going to make the website? So you can see how these things get very difficult very quickly. And that's why as long as you have a, a way of, and just kind of like a democratic method, a system of going about handling these things, and you're able to schedule and work with each other, this, it's not a big deal. It's like, okay... So we've been doing the math, and it's going to cost us $1,000 to, to replicate 1,000 CDs, and I'm just making up numbers. Is that what we want to do? And we can argue about it all you want, or, hey, for the time being, let's just build a website and put them on MP3s, and we can sell them off iTunes, you know? 
And at the point, if we want CDs, we, well, what we can do is we can make, uh, you know, just burn copies and hand them out, whatever you want to do, or we can just, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Now that the internet's so big, you can, uh, you can just, you know, make note of this is your, your, uh, your website. Or what if you gave out like stickers or, or, or merchandise, you know, just cheap little trinkets, you know, like stickers or patches, this, that, and the other thing that has your website on it. That'll get people to, to see it so that you don't have to hand out a CD. Everything you hand out is merchandising material. So if we're going to do that, then this is what it's going to cost $500 for 20,000 stickers. And I'm just making up numbers. Is that something you all want to do? Okay, in that case, we all need to put them 125, blah, blah, blah. And this is, and that's how we're going to do it. So we're all in the grill. Okay, cool. Bam. Then you go do it. You know what I mean? It's just, but you have to have that system, that democratic system. Even if you have somebody who kind of leads that process or is the one that kind of makes the phone calls. That's the kind of role that that kind of a band leader has to have, right? And that's kind of the, the way you have to go about doing it, right? And that's kind of where I fell short of is I was that person, but I was like 19 to 20 and I didn't have all this stuff figured out. I wasn't respectful enough of other people's visions and opinions and I didn't care for, and I didn't let them know how much I cared about them. And what do you know? I'd squash their, their, visions and their efforts and next thing you know people stop putting in the effort and then they kind of got shunned and they stopped caring go figure and that's how most bands break up because they just stop caring so these are just some things that you can kind of do to prevent that stuff from happening not to say that you can prevent it completely but you can help prevent it <laughs> by having a system for how you make decisions and making sure that you do more yeah you you as a leader talk to these people to make sure that they feel like they're being valued. And I think that's fair because at the end of the day, if you're the one writing the music and they're helping you, they're helping you co-write it and push it. You need to respect that. And I think that's more than fair. All right. And the final kind of band leadership scenario I want to talk about is cover bands. Now this one's a little more cut and dry. And while I have never personally been in a cover band, I've known plenty of people who have and have talked to them and seen them play and see how these things kind of work out. And generally speaking, the way these things work out is you usually have one person, sometimes two, if they're like kind of two good friends, that kind of thing. But generally you have one person who kind of gets everything together, built up, puts out the, the, the want ads for other musicians, kind of goes through it. And they're the ones that usually has the PA, has the practice play space, and are the ones that kind of get everything running, make, book the shows, etc. And they're the, usually the ones that kind of help determine when, you know, how much you make, where we're booking, that kind of stuff. And those bands operate very, very similar to the original band that has like the one main guy that, you know, it's kind of backs everything. It's got everything up and running already. And you're just more of sort of a hired gun. But when it comes to cover bands in those kind of situations, you basically are a hired gun. And I think that it's important that you make sure that the, the if you're going to be that, that leader type was like, look, I already know a hundred cover songs that I want to play. It's just a matter of, can you, can you learn them? Right. Can you get together and rehearse with me on them? And then how quickly can we do this so we can get out there and start making money? And when you go and you have like a cover band like that, I think you have to treat it more like a business. I mean, I'd say you have to treat it as much of a business as an original band that has like already a CD going, but it's different because um, the, good, the, the good news is while the ceiling may not be quite as high, uh, it's, it's more like, hey, look, I'm not asking you to spend this time that, you know, just unnecessarily. Look, these are the songs we want to play. Learn them as best you can. We're going to get together and rehearse these 10 songs. We're going to get together and rehearse these 10 songs. All right. And then we're going to play the, those 20 together. Then we're going to rehearse another 10 songs, rehearse those, and then we're going to rehearse another 10 songs so that we have 40 songs. So at the very least, we got ourselves 40, 50, let's say 50 songs that we can make a cover set, right? And we're, I'm going to book us a gig as soon as we get that to where we can play it somewhat decent, you know? And may not be the world's best gig. It might be one of those things where it's like, okay, you get 300 bucks for a, a th you know, a three or four piece band, but whatever, you're all making money. You know, let's, let's get to, and you could look at them as once you, some of your early gigs are kind of more like paid rehearsals is what they really are. Cause you've rehearsed enough on your own dime, just well enough to kind of get it figured out. And then 
with each other. So you might rehearse five, six, seven, eight times before you're playing shows. You know what I mean? And oftentimes, people that join cover bands have already been in cover bands previously. So there's a certain level of cover band hopping where people go up and up and up. But usually they go up because to replace somebody that had to quit for whatever reason, and it's with a more upscale cover band. And there are more upscale cover bands. You got cover bands making 250 a night. You got cover bands making 800 a night. Just depends on how good you are, the amount of overhead you have in it, and how good you do, and the kind of places you're playing. And naturally, the more requests you can take, and the better are you at it, and the more you've been doing it, and the more reputable your name, the more you're going to make at it. So there are people making full-time livings off of their cover band, you know what I mean? So naturally, they treat it as a business much more so. So if you're, but if you're at the one, the, the point where you're trying to start a cover band and you're more entry level and you've been, you know, some 50 or 60 songs from other people and you're trying to get other people on board, the best way I know of to go about it is just to be straight. <clears throat> Don't try to manipulate people and, and trying to rip them off. It's kind of like, uh, be transparent. But at the same time, be honest with them from the get-go. It's like, <clears throat> hey, I will, you know, I'm going to do my best to guarantee you guys, I, like, you will, it, it, once we get this started, you know, I can't guarantee you how much you're going to make initially, right? But I will guarantee you that when we start playing gigs, we will make some money when we do it. And the better we do it and the more we do it, the more money I'll be able to make by booking better gigs, right? And they get it. And so the point is, you got to get them invested and you realize that what's in it for them. You know, so you get it to the point where you want to make sure that people are at least making a hundred, hundred fifty bucks a night. Set up the tip jar, but realistically, if you got it to where people are making a hundred fifty bucks a night, you know, for three, four hours of work, they feel like okay, that was that was worth it to them. You know, they sure they had to make a drive. So altogether, they put in five or so, six hours of their life. You know, made a hundred fifty bucks, and it's like, well, you could say that's not like, I mean, I. I work for more than one hundred fifty dollars a day. Don't get me wrong, you know, and I work for more than two nights a week. But if you're able to consistently get one gig a week at one hundred fifty bucks, you know, the, the way they look at it, it's like, hey, I work four days a week and I get an extra six hundred bucks. You know, that's great. Uh, and they look at it like six hundred dollars a month times twelve, you know, months out of the year. And the way they look at it is like, hey, I just made an extra, you know, seventy two hundred bucks this year. Hey, let's start, you know, well, what if we were to do two gigs? Well, that would be more like, you know, uh, that'd be more like fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. You know, <clears throat> that's when it becomes a little bit more lucrative to people. And you also have to kind of know the kind of people that you're playing with. Are these people who are trying to do this full time? Well, in that case, playing one time a month is not going to cut it for them. They want to play two times minimum, you know. But realize that. Hey guys, just realize if this is what we want to do, that means you're committing every Friday and Saturday night off, right? And if you want a Friday or Saturday night off, you need to let us know well in advance because for you to take that night off, that means we're not making money too. And so, but it's different if it's, if when you've got it with, you know, a group of two or three other people who need to do this full time versus you got a two or three other people who do this just kind of like, you know, a few times out of the month just to make a little extra money and it's kind of fun for them. You know, so you have to kind of realize who your other musicians are in the band and what their needs are and make sure that the decisions you're making are practical for them. So that's great. You want to go deer hunting in November, but that means that if you're going to do that, they're not making money either. But at the same time, if you generally pay them well, then you're like, hey, guys, it's, going to, it's just going to be understood. You know, let's all take, just, just go out there. Let's all take, Let's all guarantee ourselves two weekends off. Just let us know in advance what they're going to be, but let's try to keep it to within two to four weekends that you need off to do something, you know, for your family, friends, whatever. I like to go deer hunting. I want this week off, and then I usually like to do something with my kids on this weekend off, so let me take this one. You know what I mean? Because even though you're working, you're working late in the night, so it's not like you can't do stuff. You know what I mean? It just means you need to carve out a six-hour chunk for you to do your cover band thing on those nights and you need to be able to sleep accordingly. So it's not a it's not like you can't do anything, but there's just sometimes like if you want to take a vacation, that's just not an option, you know? But it's just one of those things. Keep in mind the kind of musicians you're playing with and what what that means to them. If that is their sole income and that's what your plant your goal is, 
then realize you need to play two to three times a week, every single week, as many gigs as possible. But you also have to be, guys, during the winter months, things slow down. So that's when you want to take some time off. You know, hey, we're, we're you know, and that's when you want to be realistic with them. Guys, if this, is, this is an $80 gig. Sorry, we'll put out tips. We're going to have to really work the audience to try to get tips. But other than that, I mean, I only, I only booked this gig for, this is a $240 gig, and there's three of us. You do the math, you know? But that's just something, you, you know, you have to be realistic on. But at the same time, if you're the one booking all the shows and everything, and you, you're, you're pretty much like, you know, it, it gets kind of weird because when you get to a point where it's like, huh, I just booked a $600 gig, and you know what? I'm paying these other two guys 150 most of the time. Should I take 300 on this gig? Well, let's think. You're the one who has the practice space. You have the PA that you shuttle around. You book the gig. What's wrong with taking a little bit more money this time? Nothing. However, what's going to end up happening is then the other guys are going to find out what, you're made, what you made on that gig. And it's just a matter of time. And so maybe, you know, well, especially if you have another friend that you're real close with, like, well, how, how are you going to do that to me? You're making more money on these gigs, but you're paying me the same, you know? This is my job, my income. And at that point, it's real simple. This is what I'm just telling you. This is what you got to do. If you make more money on a gig, pay the other guys more money. So if it's a $600 gig, you know, and you normally pay them $150, well, you could split it evenly and say everyone does gets 200 or you could do something like, hey, you know, guys, we're making a little extra money on this gig, so I'm going to throw in an extra 25 bones. You know what I mean? That way they're making 175 for a total of uh, 350 bucks, and you're still making 250 bucks. You know, so you're making $100 more for that gig than there, but in all fairness, you put in the effort. You know, you've got the PA. You, made the, you booked the gig. You're the one that got it started. I think that's fair. But at the same time, it's... If you make extra money on a gig, make sure to pay them extra. It's, you know, generally people don't have a problem with you making a little bit more on a particular gig so long as they do too. And realize that without them, you can't do it. You know what I mean? So sometimes it kind of sucks. And there are times, you know, <clears throat> when you're, you got to look at it as a business owner. When you're booking a gig and it's like, well, crap, I normally pay these guys 150 but I'm only get this, you know, this is only a $300 gig, but it's on a Thursday night, you know, what, whatever. Guys, hey, you can either, and you have to just kind of be real. If like, you have to, it kind of sucks sometimes, but sometimes you may have these expectations with these people that, hey, you know, every time you guys go out and play, I'm going to pay you $150. If that's the case, that's the case. If you don't want to break it, then that's how it is. But realize that means, that you're not, you didn't make any money on that gig, you know? So I think it's honestly best to be transparent on this stuff. And, you know, maybe the best way to go about it is like, look, guys, look, I'm the one doing all this, the effort I put for the, the bill on everything. So I think it's fair that I make, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers that I get uh, 40% and you each make 30%. You know what I mean? I get a little bit of a uh, premium on top of that or whatever. Like every show, I'm going I'm to take $50 at, for me just because I'm the one who booked the gig and made it happen. I think that's fair, right? But after that, we're going to split it 40. I'll, I'll get 40% and 30% for you guys. And then there's sometimes, it's, it's, it's a really cool thing to do when it's like, hey guys, this is a $300 gig. Let's just split a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? That's that's the kind of thing you have to do. But I would say have have a, a working arrangement that works for all of you. Towards like, look, this is a four hundred dollar gig. You know what I mean? I'm gonna take my my fifty dollar cut for booking the gig. And if you guys book a gig, same thing applies. You know, or whatever. Like you just find out something that works. But if you're the one that basically books every single gig, you know what I mean? And you try to get these these gigs for around four hundred dollars, which isn't unreasonable if you're a decent band, you know. And you get forty percent of that, you know. You're basically taking home about one hundred forty bucks, while the other guys who are are taking home. Oops, let me get my calculator. Uh, set of times I can't even. 
So you're taking 105. So basically you're taking home 150 bucks. They're taking home 100. And that's just how that works. You know what I mean? But, you know, to each, the, that's just kind of the, the, the way it works, you know? But realize that, generally speaking, it seems like the way for a, a, a cover band is to do the three piece because there's just more money. The more people you put in there, the less money everyone gets. But, you know, I, I think the best thing to do is be transparent have a system like this is how we this is how we separate monies when we make a gig it's like hey understand a three-hour gig on a tuesday is not going to generate you as much money as a four-hour gig on a saturday night so hey look it's a 250 dollar gig but it's only a two-hour gig and you know i'm gonna take my 50 dollars for whatever because i booked the gig you know and so now we're looking at 200 dollars left off a 250 dollar gig and you get 60 bucks and because i'm a nice guy here throw 75 bucks you know whatever whatever you got to do to make it make the numbers work but just kind of like be transparent on what you're making on the gig uh i mean up until you hit a certain level of success because if you're not transparent then people are going to feel cheated and that's how cover bands get broken up it's like look i already don't make that much money as it is and you're going to try to rob you know steal from me how big of a low life are you you know what i mean and if you're you're that kind of a person in the cover band where you're the leader of it, do those little extra things. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, if we're to break it down to that, ah, screw the fifty dollars. You know what I mean? It's only a two hundred fifty dollar gig. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna pay all each seventy five bucks. You know, whatever. We're gonna all make about seventy five dollars out of this, and let's just really push tips hard this time. You know what I mean? And that's the kind of thing where like people really appreciate it. You're not out there trying to be greedy, but you're you know. You're respecting the fact that, hey, you're having to put in some effort into this, but hey, just at the same time, respect the fact that I had to put more effort into this. I'm the one who's booking the shows. I'm the one who's providing the PA. I'm the one moving it around, and that that does, and I'm basically the one helping to employ you. So, you know, granted, I respect what you're doing for me, but at the same time, please respect what I'm doing for you. And I think that that's how the relationship is built. There's no reason why those 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 bands can't survive the test of time. But the second you cross those boundaries, it's just you're, you know, you're walking in quicksand. It's just a matter of time before you sink. All right. And that's pretty much all I have to say on that for right now. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your effort in listening. And more importantly, I'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.